Malcolm X was assassinated on February 21st, 1965 by black Muslims, and this very much also helped uh, his whole legacy. It became, he became retrospectively much more famous than he was at the time. I want to talk now about the Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee, um, and this is really the predecessors of uh, the uh, black power movement. This was a movement founded in 1960 after the sit-ins in Greenboro, North Carolina, inspired many black and white students to challenge segregation. And from the outset, there was tension emerged between white and black field workers, but when it was first uh, created, it was nonviolent. Uh, it was created by the people that sat in, these, uh, in, the, in the, the Woolworths canteen in Greenboro uh, and in other places spontaneously following that protest. Uh, and it was very religious. As you can see from the slide, uh, come let us build a new world together, uh, student nonviolent coordinating committee, and also by including nonviolent in, 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 the, in, the, um, in the name of the thing, uh, it very importantly put over the message that uh, we uh, want to, by nonviolence, achieve our aims. The beginnings of black power came when Stokely Carmichael was elected chairman of the Mississippi uh, Freedom Democratic Party, and also uh, very much later, uh, a year later, uh, within uh, the SNCC. Stokely Carmichael was a young activist who had been out uh, trying to garner, uh, register people for the vote um, in Mississippi and Alabama, and uh, he had, a, he was a field worker who had a few years um, uh, under his belt by the time he represented the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Um, he became deeply disillusioned when the 1964 Democratic National Convention preferred to seat the pro-segregationist Mississippi Democrats instead of uh, the alternative Mississippi Freedom and Democratic Party. And this led to a great disillusionment um, a, a, amongst uh, many people, Stokely Carmichael foremost amongst them. By February 1965, it was reported that the Negro leadership is badly split in the civil rights movement. The slogan Black Power, however, was first heard on a march in Mississippi on June 5, 1966. Uh, the march against fear was a sojourn by a lone James Meredith uh, to encourage blacks to register to vote. After Meredith was shot by a sniper, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, King's organization, uh, the Congress on Racial Equality, or CORE as it was sometimes referred to, and the SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, agreed to continue the march on behalf of Meredith. Uh, there were disagreements. Carmichael, who disagreed with Martin Luther King about whether to welcome white support, proclaimed that day, what we need is black power. Uh, you can see in the picture here um, Martin Luther King and Stokely Carmichael um, on the March Against Fear. Now, what really propelled black power, of course, was not so much Stokely Carmichael on that march, but the responses to it, uh, really antagonistic responses. So Vice President Hubert Humphrey condemned black power. He said, we must reject calls for racism, whether they come from a throat that is white or one that is black. We will reject calls for racism. The mainstream civil rights movement, being one of the chief targets of black power's uh, anger, remained hostile, but incorporated some of the rhetoric of black power. Black power immediately sounded uh, uh, very radical, and to uh, get on that, that sort of uh, radical train, uh, the mainstream civil rights movement started talking, talking about black power. It has to be emphasized that black power at this stage was only supported by a minority of African Americans. Right throughout the 1960s it was. Only 10% of African Americans thought they should operate, for instance, outside of the two-party system throughout the 1960s. In 1967, survey of blacks in Detroit uh, uh, noted that 86% favored integration and only 1% endorsed separatism. In Chicago in 1968, 57% of blacks thought Martin Luther King best represented their position, 3% Stokely Carmichael. However, it depends how you ask the question because uh, it's worth, and in history we are, we are forever balancing our claims uh, with counterclaims. And as one author pointed out, a majority of those polled in Watts in 1968 supported black power. If you simply asked people, do you support black power, they would say yes. Do you support it 
um, and many of the surveys were actually aimed at shooting down black power and um, would you rather support Martin Luther King or Stokely Carmichael? Then the question is somewhat different. Black power, yes. Yeah, I'm not so sure about Stokely Carmichael over Martin Luther King. The other backdrop to this, of course, uh, as you will see in the picture, is uh, the long, hot summers of rioting that occurred throughout the 1960s. And uh, riots, uh, for instance, probably the worst riot in, actually not even probably, actually the worst riot of, of the 1960s occurred in Detroit in 1967 um, in the summer uh, where 43 people died and armored cars patrolled the streets to restore order. Uh, riots and the civil rights backlash that it, uh, uh, created a real polarization between radicals who had lost patience with nonviolence and the older generation who had not yet. And uh, there was a real difference, in, in a generational difference um, that was showing up and uh, manifesting itself in black power. It's worth saying something about the civil rights backlash uh, because this is often touted. This was a journalistic creation, the civil rights backlash. Um, created in, in about 1965 to explain why white voters were, were going for, um, uh, not going for Lyndon Johnson, that there was a, there was a sign of a backlash uh, when George Wallace began to pick up third party votes in 1964 and picked up 13% of the third party votes in 1968. This was known as the backlash. Uh, what you can say is that in 1966, the Republicans uh, suddenly began an ascension that would lead to the uh, um, election uh, of President Richard Nixon. And uh, that this uh, so-called backlash meant that people actually wanted the civil rights movement to slow down from around 1965, 1966. And they associated civil rights uh, with the rioting that happened. And it, this caused a lot of uh, white Americans to jump off the liberal ship just as African Americans uh, were doing and to reject uh, the moderate claims of the civil rights movements and, and to say no more. I'm not sure whether it can accurately be called a backlash. That is something that uh, is, is, uh, happens in, in historical scholarship and uh, you can do that much, much later. So black power really in some ways is an expression of this dis dissolution. There were some very odd black power advocates as, as the picture of Richard Nixon above you uh, will indicate. Uh, Richard Nixon called in 1968 uh, for the support of black militants to vote for him in a radio speech and core radical and black power advocate Floyd McKissick supported Richard Nixon's bid for the presidency in 1968 and supported the whole idea of black capitalism. And Nixon gave McKissick's predecessor, James Farmer, a position as Assistant Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare. So some went off to the Republicans. The fragmentation of black power in many ways mirrors the fragmentation of liberalism that happens during this period of time. Uh, radicals like Carmichael created the Black Panther movement, which I'll talk about. Uh, conservatives supported the black capitalism espoused by Richard Nixon. Others retreated from the streets to the campuses, uh, creating black studies course and sporting the cultural attributes of black power like Afros and Dashikis. I hope I've pronounced that Dashikis correctly. Uh, the Black Panther Party. This is a fascinating uh, part of history uh, that students are always interested. This was founded in Oakland, California in 1966. The Black, Party, Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, to give it its proper name, its first act was to appear armed at the California legislature uh, to protest against gun control legislation. People who associate with this with gun control legislation with the right No, it. Actually, the real protests came from the Black Panther Party who uh, told all African Americans they should arm themselves before only the pigs have guns. It stress, stressed self-defense, mostly from police brutality for African Americans, and it had an extremely fiery rhetoric, total liberty for black people or total destruction of America. It sold Mao's little red book openly on the streets, and it policed black neighborhoods, uh, whereupon if the police were found arresting somebody, uh, black panthers who were armed would uh, read them uh, the uh, acts, uh, the legal acts that would constrain their actions. None, not, uh, I don't really have to say that they were not the most uh, popular amongst the police. Uh, here is a Black Panther Party poster, um, which shows, as you can see, from the bullets going into the oink oink, that, that they were not, uh, the, the 
the malevolence uh, towards the, uh, that the police held for the Black Panthers was returned. And um, because of this fiery rhetoric, they took up the place where Malcolm X had, had left off. Uh, they became public enemy number one. And because of the revolutionary pretensions, it became extremely popular, not just among, uh, amongst African-American youth, but amongst the counterculture. The counterculture is happening at a big pace from 1967 onwards, and they get involved in the Black Panther Party. Very prominent figures uh, like Leonard Bernstein, the celebrated composer, and uh, Marlon Brando, the, the celebrated actor, gave a large amount of money towards the Black Panther Party, and uh, in a very uh, famous uh, scene, Leonard Bernstein invited Black Party, Panther Party members up to his apartment in uh, Manhattan, a very Swiss apartment, uh, with his uh, uh, Swiss friends, uh, invited the Black Panther Party to speak at this apartment. Uh, uh, something that was uh, very fun, uh, captured in a, in a novel by Tom Wolfe. A uh, very interesting scene. So, Black Panther slogans like off the pigs could be heard on campuses as well as um, inside, um, inside uh, other, uh, inside ghettos. The Black Panther Party also provided free breakfasts for children, free shoes and clothing, legal assistance and medical care. So it wasn't simply about violence and in fact they instructed their members not to be violent. Um, however, despite this instruction not to be violent, the, the Black Panther Party was destroyed by internal divisions but also by police shooting. 24 members of the Black Panther Party were shot to death by the police um, in a six-year period, and many more were incarcerated uh, on trumped-up charges. And in fact, FBI files that are uh, allowed today under the Freedom of Information Act shown that uh, many of the internal divisions were actually sown by their agents, and there was a very much a dirty tricks campaign. In fact, there's good evidence to show that Fred Hampton one of the Black Panther Party members in 1968 uh, was killed purposefully by the police because he was drugged by an FBI informant and was lying in bed uh, unconscious when he was shot to death uh, by the police. So, what is the legacy of the Black Power Movement? First of all, Black Studies programs. Where did all the Panther supporters go? Where did all the Black Power uh, people go? They went into the campuses, off the streets and into the campuses, whereupon where they uh, began black studies programs. So black history emanates from, from this whole mo movement. Uh, the emphasis on cultural natural nationalism, uh, black, the, the so-called black arts, um, fashions, movies, um, all the sort of uh, black exploitation movies of the 1970s, they all emanate from this. Uh, the cultural symbols, the Afro, which was a very big thing, and even some rather sad white people had it in the uh, late 1960s and, and early 1970s. Not me, not me, just I hasten to add. But they also did interesting things like drug rehab centers in ghettos, uh, which was a fascinating experiment and was actually picked up by Richard Nixon, who actually created drug rehabilitation courts uh, for the very first time. So they did have influences uh, beyond uh, their, uh, the Black Panther movement, for instance, only had a core membership of less than 100, so it, it did not have a huge amount, but it did have some legacies. The most important legacy, perhaps, is the model that black power left for other movements, uh, both in the United States and internationally. It fueled militants, not just in, in the United States, but all, all sorts of places, and everybody from the women's liberation movement to the Quebecois to students in Paris in 1968, to the provisional IRA in 1969, in some way were inspired and felt the influence of, uh, and in some ways modeled themselves on black power. Uh, however, black power was itself part of the fragmentation. This is what I've hoped to, to get across to you, is, is this, that it's part of the, the process of fragmentation of the civil rights movement and of post-war liberalism's institutions in the United States. It's all part of, <coughs> part of this uh, large fragmentation that's occurring at this time. Black power did little to alleviate economic equality. By 1980, for instance, um, it, it had, its effects had, had not been shown. If you take a look at it, uh, what a black uh, family earned in 1958, uh, it earned 56% of what its white counterpart earned. Um, and even by 1994, 
it only earned 54% of white family earnings. Um, and you, you see that there's, there's a great fruitlessness in the whole thing. Nonetheless, I do think uh, the legacy um, is, is uh, fairly important.